mid-October in Chatham, Massachusetts. Saltwater options are waning on Cape Cod. The Albies are history, the fall striper run is fizzling, and the bluefish never showed at all. But the Cape's largest game fish, the giant bluefin tuna, is still present in astounding numbers. In a fishery full of big egos, Captain John Clothier walks softly and carries a big stick. A whole boat full of big sticks, in fact. When we arrive at the Regal Sword a bit after sunrise, John slows the shear water and keeps his eyes on the fish finder. After he stops, I glance at the screen and see a trio of big red boomerangs that can mean only one thing. There are tuna under the boat. Rig these up with a bridle rubber band. It's going to go right through the nostrils of the mackerel. Just like that. Instead of the shouting and cursing you see on certain tuna TV shows, John provides calm instruction. Many fishermen have defeated their first giants aboard John's Shearwater, and I'm hoping to join their ranks. for the next one. Now, are you looking to set that at kind of the approximate depth where you were seeing the Yeah. So, so I'm going to try to put this down about 75 feet. I'm going to need one of those balloons. There. Ready? John, the terminal gear on that, about what size circle hook do you have there? That's a seven knot offset circle. Okay. Yeah. Attached to and how, what kind of leader it's is that? It's about a 12 foot, uh, 170 pound fluorocarbon leader. And what, uh, what's your main line here? The main line on these 130s is 200 pound. Oh, we got some. Okay, there we go. Something on here, I don't know if it's a shark or a tuna, but. Oh, man. Okay. Give me a... Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you're going to have to walk me through this, man. I've never okay. done... Uh... Sure. Well, it's just going to let it run here. Taylor, you want to see if you can get him a glove for his yep. left hand? Okay, so as soon as it stops running, you want to get on the, on the reel and okay. make sure you keep that rod bent over real good. So that's the most, just keep it bent? Yeah, keep tight. the pressure on it. I'm gonna put the drag up to strike there. Yep, yep, real, real fast here. Hold the line with this hand. You don't have to worry too much about level winding. Just hold the rod. I, I'm gonna move the boat for you. Until I, I can love back here when you all are. There you go. So pull the line yep. down? Yep. So okay. you pull down as you're cranking once, once you stop taking line. <laughs> when, he's, when he's going, yeah. let him go, and then once he starts leveling up, then start cranking on him. Okay. You ready to reel? Yeah, we'll try to bring the boat towards him okay. a little bit. So just crank it as fast as I can, yep. There you go. It's still there? Yep, yep, keep cranking. Finally, turn. Keep going, keep going. To be fair, I expected a little more time to get ready for this. I didn't expect it to happen while we were setting <laughs> out the first bait. There's a balloon. So presumably 75 feet below that. <laughs> I should be talking more. Though. All right, 
Keep it up. Keep it up. He's still there. And he's gonna see the bow and then he's gonna take off again. John, the, these rods that we're using, I mean, what, yeah. what are these? These aren't your typical uh, tuna trolling rod. You know? No, they're they're extra long, and they have an 80 class blank, even though you're using a 130 reel. Uh, and that just gives it a lot more flexibility when, uh, you know, when the fish is diving or whatever, and gives you a little more time to react. When the boat goes down or the fish comes at you, there's more spring in the rod, so the line won't go slack Okay, as quick. If you use a, a stiffer rod, will uh, you can put a little more force on the fish. But the downside to that is uh, that you wind up with slack line more often because it, it's absorbing less of the, uh, you know, less stress. So if something comes loose, it'll kind yeah, of throws a little slack it's not at bent them. over as far. Yeah. I didn't want that extra long because you're fishing them out of the holder, out of the swivel yeah. rod holder. Yeah, so. I like the longer rods. Uh, it keeps it keeps the line away from the boat a little better. You do a little less maneuvering when they're close to the boat. Gives you even more more of the absorption, like I was saying. So that one we just lost. Probably not a 50 to 60 inch fish. Probably a little no, bit bigger than that. No, that was probably 90 to 100 inches. No, like no, that. don't. Yeah. Oh, oh no, for sure. I'm not. Come on. That makes it. Just tell me it was 65 inches. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you would have had a 65 incher in the boat a lot quicker than that. Oh, that's a, I was, uh, that's what I was worried about. I was worried yeah. it was going to come up. It's going to be 50 inches, and people, you guys are going to look at me like, what the hell's wrong with this? Yeah. Thing? yeah. <laughs> no, that Didn't wasn't going to be a problem that time. Still way down, Taylor. Okay, let's get this out of the way, then we're gonna move the rod back. You think it's a good time to move it and get the drag way back? You ready? Big one for you, Jimmy. Oh, God. You're at your uh, backing. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys, I'm going to try to chase this down a little bit here, okay? So, John was just telling us he's got about 200, 300 yards of mono, and then the backing. So, this fish is at least three football fields away from us right now. John just started the boat to chase it down. Taylor's trying to just keep the line tight, keep constant pressure on it. So what's your strategy with maneuvering the boat while, if, while you've got one hooked up? Yeah. Well, it, since it's pretty rough out here today, uh, I can't really back down on it. You know, we'll just be taking waves over the back, so I just have it up at an angle up off the, the port uh, front of the boat, and I'm just trying to gain line by coming up alongside it. Be its next move after we get a lot of the line back, it'll want to go down. We're in about 180 feet of water here, so it's got plenty of 
plenty of room to go down, so. Whenever you're ready, Jimmy, I'm sure Taylor could use a break. All right, yeah, hey. You want to take over? Yeah, sure, man. Absolutely. Right. Ready? You did, you did the hard part. <laughs> Late season tuna trips are always motivation to hit the gym more in the winter. What point do you know to let go of the line? Just if, if he's trying to go, just... Yeah, watch your rod tip. When it starts to come up a little bit, you, pressure's coming up, and that's when you can start cranking. Okay, be ready to swing that rod around the back. Real, real, real. Real, go, go. Yeah, it's another real big fish. The other one, the hook pulled. I think that one was on me. I think that fish was trying to run, and I tried to uh, prevent him from running. I should have should let go of the line a little bit faster. The, you know, the thing you have to realize when you attach to a fish that size is that he's in charge, man. If he's going to head the other way, he's not ready to turn around. You just got to let him go. And it's, uh, so that one, that one was on me. So we've got one bait out fishing, and Taylor is uh, Taylor and I are well. He's the one adding to the live well. I'm I'm trying to, but uh, yeah, toss that back. Probably don't need that. Sorry, Jimmy. Uh, it's okay. I... <laughs> <laughs> Just dropping a sabiki to the bottom and trying to get some more live baits. Nice. So far, he's picked up one sea herring and one uh, one mackerel. So two choice baits. And at the rate we were going through uh, through the live baits when we first got here this morning, it's good that. It's good to be able to restock out here. There we go. They're whiting. Definitely. Got a little better whiting? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, nice. Wow, look at that mackerel. All right, so let's get a bait out and wait. It's on. All right, you ready? Just shark. Probably a shark. I don't know. We went over. Looks like tuna on the yeah. fish finder. Kind of seems like a tuna that just hasn't woken up yet. I don't know. So just when he does that, lay off. And then when, as soon as I see the rod tip yep. go up, just start to gain. That was a big one. That was a big one. 
Oh, you want to uh, tap in? I was getting anywhere. I'm a little gun shy too after uh, the last one. Taylor, so when the sinker comes up, just snap it or. You, yeah. Ah, forward. Shark. Shark. I don't know. Forward. No, dude, push dude, that up. line off, Jimmy. Push that line no. off. How big? Uh, it's like big enough to keep. Yeah, you want to you harpoon it. Jimmy, get on the line. Get okay. on the, get I don't on know. the rod. Set, nah. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Watch your feet. Yeah, stick it. It's Did I hit the first? Uh, gill plate looked like it. He was straight up and down for a while, and then all of a sudden he just appeared. Yep. You can just flip that fish around maybe, and get the gaff out. Nice work. Uh, hey, all I did was not mess it up, so that's that yeah. time. I, I <laughs> Perfect. A fish that we're gonna keep uh, you know, it's a recreational fish like this, probably 10 to 15 minutes, uh, just to get it all bled out, we'll tow it for a little bit. Oop. Having lost the two giants, we elect to harvest the smaller, recreational sized fish. Its meat will make us heroes among our co-workers and family back on land. But the lost giants haunt me. While I'm happy we landed a fish and saved our episode, I chickened out on the fight, worried that if I lost a third tuna, our camera crew would toss me over to take my chances with the poor beagle sharks. I'm happy to hear that John and Taylor are willing to send out one last mackerel to give me a shot at redemption. All of our baits get bit within minutes of setting them out. Most of the time, it's a shark mangling the bait fish or slicing the leader, but just often enough, it's a giant bluefin tuna. Yeah, so one thing about the October weather is that it kind of does this on you. you know, they may predict a calm day, but weather windows get pretty narrow in the fall, and weather's, uh, waves are definitely picking up. The wind seems to be freshening, but we're gonna try one more bait. And uh, honestly, I don't know if we've had a bait swim for more than 15 minutes all day. So, spent most of our time fighting fish and re-rigging. Very little waiting for a bite. Just like every bait we've set up until now, the mackerel swims for just a few minutes before it's eaten. And the roar of the drag lets us know it's another tuna, and a big one. Just couldn't even get the last another rod rigged. <laughs> Jesus. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, it's way off there. Right? Wow, that's another <laughs> All right, Jimmy, how's that right arm doing? Yeah, I, this is gonna have to be a team, uh, a team <laughs> effort. <laughs> no, you gotta do it solo. I'll be the Wiley reliever. <laughs> You're gonna have to crank all that back in. <laughs> just any gain is a good gain, you know. I mean, just so just even yeah, a even a little bit. Crank yep. and time to crank just, anything. Yep. That's why you have the rod that's kind of the shock Flexible absorption rod, from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for rough rough conditions, it really helps. I guess a little bit of stretch in the mono, too, helps, you know. How often do you change over everything? Pretty often, you know, I mean, doing this. Yeah, when you're keeping them, you only need to get your one, you know, and release them. Exactly, yeah. You go through a lot more tackle doing this, yeah. How you doing, Taylor? All right. breaker, yeah. If you want to hop on, be my guy. So 
So more than anything, you're watching like the rod tip for cues on what to do? Yeah, watch the rod tip, exactly. Yeah, as fast as you can go there, Jimmy. Get that line in. That rod bent back over. There you go. Go. While the first two hookups help me find a rhythm to the yank and crank fighting style, as my arm fatigues, my form suffers. No one would describe my appearance fighting this tuna as wicked, but I'm gaining line nonetheless. Big wave coming. As thoughts of tapping out are creeping in, I catch my first glimpse of the fish, a giant purple torpedo gliding through the trough between waves. Just like that, I catch my second wind and hope against hope that the tuna doesn't catch his. Gotta back up to him a little bit. Yeah, just keep trying. Okay, hold on. Where's that leader, Taylor? You got him? Right here. F it. Oh. All right. Help. Okay. Move that rod out of the way. Put it over on the other side or something. Okay, Jimmy, I need you over here to hold this gaff. Okay. Okay. And I gotta put the boat in gear and be ready when Taylor's got the fish on the swim hook to release the gaff, okay? All right. Release him? Yep. You got him? I got him. Yep. All right, can someone help me uh, cleat this? With the fish on ice, we have to release this tuna. To give it the best chance of survival, Taylor places a swim hook through its lower jaw, and John slowly drives the boat. All right, nice job. What's your guess on the length? John, what do you think, like 100? It's about a 100-inch fish, yeah. That is without a question the largest fish I've ever been attached to on rod and reel. It's not the first time we've done giant tuna on on the water. I know Chris went up to Prince Edward Island and had an amazing trip with some big fish. But what's really cool about this, this is right here in our backyard in Cape Cod. You know, we're right fishing off of Chatham, Massachusetts, and it's amazing that uh, fish like that exist. After 15 minutes of swimming this fish, it's fully regained its color. John slows the boat, Taylor removes the swim hook. There he goes. And I watch the biggest fish of my life kick out of sight. Giant tuna fishing is a team sport. It requires perfectly rigged tackle, skilled boat handling, and some schlub who can put line back on the reel without messing it up. I'm grateful to John and Taylor for letting me be that schlub, and I vow to return next season after spending a little more time at the gym.